right, it's 2.30, folks. Time for some industry update information. Brett's out of town, so Sean Damon and I are in the house and uh, ready to enjoy ourselves. I guess while the cats, what is it, the cats away, the mice will play, and <laughs> hopefully everybody's ready to party. I'm letting folks in. I'm not sure if that's my job, but I think I'm doing a good job so far. You won't, I may have to allow you to, one participant at a time. You should be able to share. I, I do have to share. You want, me to get, you want me to kick it off with the Chart Masters? Yeah, let's try that. Let's, let's go that. there Sense first. And then we've got about four or five articles. And then a conversation I had on my heart and mind is a little bit about the projected growth for Atlanta, particularly metropolitan Atlanta, which is a pretty big um, area. And then a little bit about possibly how you can market yourself a little better outside your zip and attracting people to uh, the reality of where people move and what's happening in the Sunbelt states that's continuing to happen and predicted to continue. So we'll talk about population growth. It ties into one of the Business Chronicle articles too. All right. And then I'd like to say for everybody on the call, I'd love for everybody on the call to type one observation of what you see in the real estate market right now. Be interested to see what the uh, what the audience. So just one, something you're seeing happen in the market, just type that into the chat page. I'm going to get over to uh, some chart masters and we're going to take a look at uh, actual stats from the second quarter. All right. So this should be big enough. Um, so most of you guys should be familiar with the Chart Masters report. We've used these for years. Uh, what I love is this, this report is now combined for both in town and the general Atlanta market. Um, what you'll see is these backgrounds. When it's white, that's the whole metro Atlanta market. And when it's tan, that's in inside the perimeters market. Um, but we kick it off with taking a look at sales by brokerage. Currently, Keller Williams represents 18.8% of the transactions. So literally one in five transactions in Atlanta, a little bit higher on the in-town side, is represented by Keller Williams. To me, this is, this is a graph that should always be in your listing presentation when you're talking to people and in your buyer presentation to let them know that like there's a one in five chance your house is going to be sold by a Keller Williams agent. I have these relationships already in place. Clearly, we're the dominant player in that marketplace. This is an area where yeah. you can leverage your office or your brand if your numbers aren't don't have the compelling story you're looking for yet. And um, people love to do business with people they know, love, and like, and also respect and trust. And it's a great a great segue point. Show them the data point, and then tell them how that really operates in the real world of culture and what we stand for as a company. People yeah. care. Those stories matter. Yeah. Um, this is a historical, and I'm glad they went back to 2008. Don't get bogged down in the details of this, but look at the green line. The green line running across the middle represents six months of inventory on the market. Meaning if we didn't list another house, how long would it take us to sell every house on the market based on our current absorption rate? That is the average mean. Six months of a balanced market between a balanced sellers and buyers market. The black line represents where we are in inventory today. Wow. So you can see we're still we're we're in this interesting place where there's not enough listings and we're also in a seller's market, which would generally bring listings to the market. Um, so I think we're seeing some dynamics that I'm sure everyone's aware of and discussed that we have a we have a combination of right now. 80, I believe the, the correct number is 82 percent of loans in the United States are at three percent. Under four percent. Crazy which means for someone to move up, they're also going to have to move up two percentage points on their on their loan. And I think we're seeing some people hold on to their properties rather than yeah. they'll do that right now. I think that's stagnating a bit of our listing inventory. What do you think, Rick? Absolutely. I mean, why would you give away near free money? I mean, you, you know, the whole argument of, you know, take that money, roll it into an investment. At this point, there are people locked into their houses if economics, if they're you know splitting hairs and close. So that just means your story has to be that much more compelling around quality of life. And also the fact that mortgage interest is, is still tax deductible. There is a ratio that the gap's not as big as it appears when you take the benefit of the tax advantage. Yep. And here's where we see this a little more in the numbers for the year, that red line on the far right represents 2023 sales. Currently, we're down 25% in units, number of properties sold. 
right? I think one of the things that we may be running into is agents are just haven't started quite feeling this yet because pricing is up over the last three years, way over 25%. So people are making the same amount of money selling 25% less houses. If pricing catches up with that, it's going to have an impact. But you have to be careful with that statistic, Sean. I mean, at the end of the day, there's a, a, a finite number of agents and an X number of opportunities. And at this point, if there are 25 fewer sales, who do you think is capturing that, the lion's share of what is available? Yeah. There's not that 25% of additional unit availability for the new agents who are kind of looking left and right in their neighborhood and among their peer group. Yes, the experienced agents that are getting a lot of those for sure. I think so, that are heavily marketed and branded and have awareness in neighborhoods and communities. What's interesting to me here, just looking at it one more time, fourth quarter, this is the first time we've had consecutive quarters of decrease in numbers sold since the mm -hmm. second half of 2021. Just an interesting observation there. This is our supply. You know, this is, uh, again, this far right bar is a balanced market. Rick, you remember this chart 10 years ago. It was like twice as long, right? Because all the numbers were on the far right side. But uh, we're still, every single segment of the market is still in the seller's market. Um, and we're selling houses right now at 101.9% average list price to sales price was last year, 995 So that tells me we're still getting our price. We're not getting- Well, it's interesting. Over, Can but... you ask people to put, you know, some observations in the chat, price decreases, price adjustments, people afraid to sell, that's true. But that chart sort of, you know, argues against the reality that it's a global experience. And what I'm guessing has driven that number is that the ones that are really hot and high demand are going for more than, a, you know, five, 10 percent over. And then the ones that are price reduced are five to 10 percent and they're netting, you know, a 101 number. Yep. Um, our median days on the market is up. This to me is a perfect example of where, you know, we need to be the. Uh, economist of choice, the ones that are sharing the information with our sphere. Because I look at this graph and go, I can see the headline right now that days on market has doubled in Atlanta since last year. <laughs> That's an accurate statement. And it went from eight days to 16 days. So yep. the reality is you still sell your house in two weeks in Atlanta if it's priced properly. You nailed it. Yep. Right. So that's uh, this is you know this is where we need to correct the dramatic headlines that we see in the market. Um, we are seeing some price reductions. You guys hit on all of these topics in the chat page. A third of properties are having to reduce their price to sell right now. That's considerable. That is a considerable difference from last year. If you utilize these tools, we'll go one more slide, then we'll get into some of these articles. This next um, slide to me is one of the most valuable. If you find that you end up in a price reduction conversation, the next question with the seller is generally, how much do we need to reduce the price? And this is where you can allow numbers to do a heavy listing because a weak answer would be, well, I think we should reduce it by $10,000, right? What you would say is if it's a $500,000 house, well, the market says that we should reduce the price by 4.3%. So for you, Mr. Byron seller, that's about a twenty-two thousand dollar price reduction. Yeah, another way to phase that in. If they're real price sensitive and feel like we're, you know, it's too soon, you could play that. So we could do three, three and a half percent now, save a percent for a week or two from now. If it doesn't move in ten days, it's probably not the four point three percent number or the number we need. I mean, in the old days, meaning six, seven years ago, we used to say 12 showings without an offer or 12 days without a showing, you knew you were overpriced. So That's here's another point. idea. Instead of telling them how much to reduce it, show them to your point using the, hey, this is what the market's telling us. 4.3 is the, the median, which means, or the average, we could go median, it could go high or low of that. So based on this information, what do you think we should do yeah. before you offer a number? Because they may just go, well, let's just go 5% or 3 whatever the number is that in their heart, at least give them the first shot at, at revealing their tolerance for a price reduction. Yeah. It's just important to be able to point to a source and go, the market's telling us this, not me. I'm not telling you your house is for less. The market's saying you should reduce your price by X amount. There you go. Yep. Um, there's a thousand other slides that we could go through here, but um, I think those hit on the, on the most important key elements to get started. And uh, 
it supports everything that everybody just put into the chat page to start to you. Dude, I just realized nine people were in the uh, waiting room. So okay. when they come on board, you guys just start cheering loudly <laughs> and really confuse them on an industry call. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> it's like roller coaster time. Make sure they feel like they missed something. I was, of course, kidding. You want to show this business chronicle out? I can. I will go there now. Uh, hopefully, I can show it. Let's see here. Uh, let's start with. Can you see this? You got it? Uh, there we go. Yep. So low housing supply expected to keep Atlanta mortgages high. I kind of misread the headline, to be honest. Um, it, it just says that because low housing, it, it it's, I thought they were going to talk about mortgage rates and why somehow that's a factor. It's not rates. It's just the actual cost of mortgages. And it's tied to supply and demand, which is no new. It's not a new conversation for us. We've had this for consecutive months and how low inventory is creating still a spike in valuation, a spike in pricing and buyer tolerance. And because of that, it's expected to stay high because we're still a very attractive market area for many reasons. Um, did you happen to read this one, Sean? Yeah, I mean, and just, it, it's this one, I think another one that we looked at that was uh, just talking about traffic patterns and where people are moving to and where people are moving from. And Atlanta still, we have growth. We have people who have to buy housing. Yeah, uh, I would argue that the the mortgage they make it sound like it's the percentage that's high, but it's just that the mortgages are high because values are still high right now. Yep. Let me pull up one more. Then let me go back. Give me one second. This is this was kind of an interesting article to some degree, but it again a lot of this stuff's clickbait just to get you to jump on it, and then they don't reveal anything that's. Um, you know, super hyper local that really is exactly it's a lot of, you know, the and be aware that's part of the problem in the world today is that people are reading, you know, they're hearing national news and they're assuming that's the local story. And it's not always the case, which is why you as the realtor should be the economist of choice who brings that information to your blogs, your newsletters, your conversations, whatever touch point you're making. One of the greatest things you can do is bring data and information that's valid, real, and impact your consumers. So the great the great migration isn't dead. I think we know this. Um, the Sunbelt cities, which Sunbelt basically runs along. Can you see my cursor? It's basically Tennessee and South Carolina all the way across. It looks like, what is that? Oklahoma all the way, New Mexico, the whole, it basically we're warm, the bottom third of the country. and you know, again, it's national news. So this is interesting and feel free if you guys don't get it, you should definitely get the Atlanta Business Chronicle. Um, but what I did after looking at this, I went and did a little bit of research and and I did, and what I found was that we grew, Atlanta, Metropolitan Atlanta grew 95,000 people last year. That is a tremendous number of people trying to now find work you know, social, cultural, restaurant, you name it, retail, they've got to go somewhere and do something. And so then I went ahead and, and Googled, what's the prediction for population growth at, to 2050? Anybody want to speculate what they expect Atlanta to do? And by the way, we're just above like six mil and maybe close to closer to seven at this point when you count the five metropolitan areas. Anybody know? Take a stab. How many do you think we're going to, people do they predict Atlanta's going to, Metropolitan, be careful with just Atlanta. I say, I'd say 3 million. 8.3 million? Good. No, I'd say I say 3 million more. 3 million. It's not quite that optimistic, but it's 1.8. And I thought, well, that doesn't mm -hmm. sound crazy. And 2050 sounds so far. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's 2023. 17, was that 27 years? So it's still like something like 70,000. Do the math. What's 1.8? Uh, 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 
divided by 20, what did we decide? 27, 66,000 people a year for 20 plus years straight. If that doesn't excite you, nothing should. Like that, that in the industry we're in, it, that means opportunity. And okay, if you so get your unfair that, share. Okay. So where is that opportunity? All right, if we've got a mass of people coming in, what, how's it going to impact what we do? You're going to see areas that are dense already. In the in-town markets, there is no more dirt, right? So you're going to see either a combination of more mixed-use development. You're going to see prices going up because there's nothing else to buy. But I would be asking myself, where's the next area? What are the areas that are growing? Some of the, you know, some of the counties that we would have considered uber rural growing up, Alden County, Henry County, on the on the, you know, on the outside of the perimeter, those are going to be the fastest growing counties. So from an investment standpoint, if you're a real estate investor, where's the dirt that's going to be worth 10 times its value in 10 years or 15 years when it's growing? Right. And then from a demographic standpoint, I mean, that's kind of a geographic way to look at this market. What led to the, you know, the great migration was COVID and people going, I can work from wherever I want. I'm going to sit overlooking the lake. I'm going to buy a 20 acre farm. I'm going to go live at the beach. Well, the economy is kind of changing. The job market is changing a little bit. And there's a lot of people who made lifestyle choices in 2020 thinking the world may end that might be changing their mind now. So I would stay really in touch with those people that made the drastic lifestyle choice and went somewhere else. And I would be in tune to conversations with people around what their work environment looks like because there's a small trend of people starting to move back now for jobs to where they moved during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. Well, people have options they've never had before and flexibility they've never had before, thanks to you know the byproduct of COVID. This is I've interesting. Someone on too. the call has seen that. Someone who moved during COVID and is moving back. If you have that experience, share it with us. While Whatever. you're think while yeah. you're thinking about it, I did have one more thing to share that's interesting. Um, and it ties back to what I the precursor at the beginning of the call where I said one of the things I want to talk about is how are you promoting the advantages the metropolitan Atlanta market has out, outside of Georgia? What are you doing in social media to spend, sell, and direct people to you? Because there are two, two major determiners to success. I, I believe this came straight from the algebra of happiness, which is the book that Brett and I are right now reviewing and sharing on Mojo Monday. So if you caught Mojo Monday today, you got a glimpse of it. It's a great book. It's pretty intriguing. And number one is skill set and capacity to meet a demand. So, you know, whether it's schooling or a trade or, you know, whether it's sales, what's your skill set and the demand? But that's the second determiner. The number one determiner is the size of the market and where you happen to live. And so what he implies and what the data suggests bigger markets offer and afford greater opportunities. If you're born in a really small town, you never leave. There's a very finite potential for big time success. Atlanta, if you keep adding 60,000 people, what in salary business, What? Where's where's the money flow? And how are you building a business that takes advantage of that opportunity? And real estate clearly is an obvious first answer. Where are they going to live? So here's another add-on, Sean. When you said demographic, what percentage of those are home buying potential clients? How many of those are renters? You know, where are they going to go? What's the workforce housing, you know, story look like? Oh. The book, Rick, what is the happiness factor that you guys are? Uh, the happiness. No, it's not the happiness advantage. The algebra of happiness. Algebra of happiness. Um, I'll look up the name while. So if you want to, that's what I had for the two articles from the Business Chronicle. If you want to pull up the Inman. Yeah, so um, interesting. We lead in, you're talking about value propositions. The article we had in Inman was really a little bit about branding. And I'll preface this by saying, if uh, if you haven't read the book, Building Your Story Brand, that's a great book to uh, to use. Why am I not sharing that? Here we go. Okay. Well, again, keep in mind if that many people are coming, what's your story? You know, it's they're after cost of living and experiential opportunities in your marketplace. And man, you, you want to spin it up into the best possible light. Yeah. 
So there's a ton of information, by the way, if you don't subscribe to Inman, it's probably worth it. There's some, uh, there's always good articles in here. Brad Inman kind of covers the real estate industry. And uh, there's an interesting article on the seven secrets for building your personal brand and your business. And it walks straight through it. Step one. So when you're looking at exactly what you were talking about, who are the people that are going to be moving here, right? Who is your ideal client? Is it a buyer? Is it a seller? First time home buyers, uh, people who are moving up, right? Once you identify that, then you come up with your unique selling proposition, right? Um, a few ways to differentiate yourself on that are to produce information or content addressing the biggest pain points or questions for your ideal client. If yeah, you're a straight road fan, fan aficionado, you know, the first thing you do is identify the challenge, right? You identify the problem. And then you create a concierge plan for your buyers and sellers that shows the services, how you can bridge that gap for them, right? Yep. Um, then you, interesting that you even use the phrase, craft your compelling brand story, uh, which is to simplify what you do. If I ask you in your business, tell me what it is that you specialize in. Do you have a clear, concise statement, right? And the formula for that is I help x do y so they can z right i help first time home buyers get financing so they can make educated financial decisions on the purchase of their home it's kind of a plug and play formula um and that's a very basic version of the book uh developing your story brand right What's so example i help x i help x your target audience or avatar? Who's the person that you most relate to or, or can serve best because of your skill set and the areas you serve? Right. And then what do you do to help them overcome their, their challenge? And where does that lead them to? Yeah, so some the examples outcome. they listed here. I help first-time home buyers purchase their homes so they can achieve the American dream of home ownership, changing the trajectory of their family's finances over their lifetime. So here's another. I help, I help investors. Yeah. I help investors find off market properties so that they can continue to build wealth even in a difficult supply low market. Perfect. There you go. It's funny. <laughs> My first one was first time homebuyers, yours was investors. And those are the two examples they give. Um, I can find it. You can find a very specific niche. I help military buyers and sellers with their homes, right? So, what's that's again, what is the audience you serve? What is your superpower? Um, and how do you how do you help people get across a gap to do that? Well, and, and Sean, social media is proving time and again with AI and with, I mean, there's it, it, the days of shotgun marketing are almost over. Yeah. The minute you mention something, your phone's picking up on it and serving you exactly what it thinks you need, not what it wants you to believe you need, because right. you suggested it. Well, speaking exactly to your point, Rick, step four is identify where your ideal clients spend their time. It's not about <laughs> shotgun marketing. Now it's about, you know, target marketing. Sniping. So then you want to, you know, then you want to advertise to those people. You want to find the ways, where are they looking, right? Um, establish a consistent visual identity. So, um, you know, we are a company that allows people to brand themselves. What's important is to recognize the difference between marketing and branding. Branding is that thing that always represents your company visually, that gives people that idea. So like there's important to have consistency of color schemes. Um, it means you should have the same font. You should have the same size. You should have the same. Your logo is either rectangular or it's uh, a square, right? What does it look like? And understanding that that brand showing it the same way over and over is what builds that consistency, right? Nike has a swoosh. It's always going to have a swoosh. Any thoughts on that, Rick? Yeah, I mean, differentiation is key. And there's, you know, five senses and visuals massive. Like you want people to recognize your color, your scheme. It, you know, how do you differentiate? We're, the sad reality is we're often, as an industry, perceived a commodity and that realtors are realtors are realtor. And we know it's not true. And so how can you make it undeniably true? And step one is in your collateral, your social media, the context and content of your posts, as well as, you know, the testimonials from your clients. How 
how far reaching does that come, you know, do those statements go, you know, great realtor use them, or is there a paragraph that's a, a feeling experiential, like what, do you, who's my ideal client and how do I make sure that my language aligns with what they want to hear? Yeah. Um, six of seven, we got two minutes left. So uh, create valuable and consistent content. So there's a couple of ways that this actually works. One, creating your own unique content is going to get a more unique hit on an algorithm of someone searching online because they look for unique content, not something that is kind of repeatable, right? They don't want to see chat GPT and find that as, as a unique content. The second part of that is consistent. So you're creating it. So if you're not someone who wants to sit down and write your own unique blog, there's different ways as a realtor you can do it. Use some sort of visual social media or videos. When you go to preview a house tomorrow at a caravan, take your phone and shoot a 90-second reel of a house that's on the market and show people that you're out there learning about the market. And, hey, I'm spending today seeing all the brand new properties that just came on the market. If you need someone to be doing that for you, give me a call, right? Um, and Hootsuite had a pretty cool thing. I, I kind of copied and pasted this. I'll put it in the chat page, too, uh, real quick. But I thought it was interesting that they came up with all the different mediums and how often you should be on them. So for Instagram, three to five times a week. But on Instagram stories, you should be posting two times per day. Facebook, one to two times per day. TikTok, between five and three times per week. LinkedIn, post between one or two times per day. And then Google Business Profile, at least one time per week. You're refreshing the information on there on a regular basis. So it doesn't get stale. You doing that, Rick? That's a lot. Got I mean, all this down? I, I got it. And, and it's funny that it coattails my three thoughts. So as we wind down, is there another one or was that the last one? Uh, it's one last one, which Let's is do that. To nurture the prospects, right? So the first six steps are about getting them in, getting them in relationship. Seven is about going deep in the relationship, right? Having events, adding value to their lives, getting to know them. You know, it's the transition that we would say going, you know, starting at eight by eight, you're establishing the connection. You go to a 33 touch to build and nurture that connection. So it's making sure you have some sort of system. If you want the most basic tried and true system that's worked for many people forever, it's one postcard a month, one email a month, one call a quarter to a 250,000, 250 person database is going to generate you $100,000 in net profit. Yeah. 12 to two in your meds. I mean, that's, it's. It, it's in the it's in the millionaire real estate agent book go back and reread that if you haven't read that in a while i know some people who make in excess of a million dollars a year in the real estate business and they'll tell you they've read it seven eight ten times and then they utilize it like an operations manual not a novel and so and realize this that touches there's a hierarchy of value inside of each strategy for a touch there's electronic which might be all the posts and, and social media and texting and emails and then there's voice, voice to voice or connectivity. And then the last is face to face. And my best advice today is recognize the hierarchy of value inside your database. Go in and make sure everyone's ranked and rated, not as a human being, but as, as someone who has capacity to potentially fuel your business and, and plus it. And make sure that you're applying the right connectivity point, you know, the, the top hierarchy of the, the people in your database, face to face, nothing beats face to face. You just can't meet 250 people face to face every month, but you can meet your top 10, your top 15 and be strategic about how you connect. Um, the last thing I, I wrote down three things like a challenge. Brett and I love to throw challenges and he's always got me thinking challenge. Get really clear on your avatar. Get really clear on your ideal best client. Write that down. Who is my if I had to prototype? And then the next question is, where are they? Where do they live, work, play? And how do I find more of them? Because there's probably 20% of your database that creates 80% of your return. And another idea to overlay, make sure back to the face-to-face, -face, make sure the 20% absolutely know you love them and that you do anything for them because they're your absolute gold medal trophy um, constituents. The second is, does your marketing material, your collateral and your message match up with that avatar? Write that down. Does my marketing material, my social media presence, my website, my the images, the conversations, the words I'm using, do they match? 
And the third one ties right into what Sean just cut and pasted. That seems like a lot of Facebook posts and a lot of like two or three a day. But you know what? These are the experts. Until you try, you won't know. So the last question I had is, am I communicating often enough to be Mac to max out my value and validity? Those three awesome. questions could double your business in the next 12 months if answered and you apply strategies to actually execute at the next, next level. Yeah. Anything to add? We're 301. Yeah, team leader in Buckhead says, I love it. All agents should know how to describe their ideal client, both now and your future ideal client. And build yeah. your brand. And make sure you're clear on what you're good at. What's your gold medal attribute? What's your, you know, Sean said it. What do you specialize in? That three-part question is golden. All right, awesome. guys. This well, was we're fun. 301. We want to bend it over. So hope we'll you enjoyed it. We'll wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. You're a rock star, man. Good to see everybody.